Rob Grant, um, writer, comedian, producer, director, and sex lord. Some of them are questions that are asked and annoy me, but mostly they are things people ask when they find out you're a writer, because people are quite interested in, in writing, because it's, it's a weird thing, it's the kind of thing that everybody thinks they can do. Um, and so or everyone's sort of at some time thought about writing. You know, they say everyone has a book in them. Mm. Um, and it's not, it's, everyone can't be a brain surgeon. You know, yeah. you know, ask a brain surgeon, yeah, how did you get into that then? I'm thinking of becoming a brain surgeon. <laughs> so so uh, some of the, the questions sort of uh, are in that area. And there are a couple of, that I just want to spout on about really. And, and, and rant. I get asked this a lot. It's a reasonable question actually, it's a very difficult one to answer because they both have their charm. The difference is that working on television it's a very collaborative process and you're very much reliant on lots of other people um, doing their job excellently and um, whereas when you're writing a novel um, you, it's just you, you know, uh, you don't have to worry that the set designer is not going to design the set you like or the actors are going to forget the lines mm. or can't say the word phenomenon, which <laughs> this is a, it's very, very common. I think, I think only one actor in every three or four can say the word phenomenon. And uh, I don't know why that is. And it comes up a lot in science fiction. On the downside with novels, you are spending a lot of time on your own and you do have quite a big risk of going insane. <laughs> a lot of writers go barking mad from uh, sitting in a room, especially successful ones, because they're kind of rewarded for their madness, so yeah. they indulge themselves in it. Um, and it's a very solitary existence. Um, and the other, the other big difference between writing novels and writing TV is, is really the amount of typing, <laughs> which is, <laughs> Um, when you're writing a, a TV script, a really long TV script is five, five and a half thousand words, and a novel, a reasonably sized novel, is about a hundred thousand words, and it's a lot of typing. And um, you're on the same project for a very long time, um, and so you better be sure it's, it's a good one. The two big thrills I get professionally, seeing my book on a bookshelf in a shop, and that's just, there is no... Uh, there is no greater thrill for me than seeing it, um, especially because I oh, very often come next to Gunter Grasser or, or Graham Greene, and that's very thrilling to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, there's that, but then actually seeing your thing on television is another, and that's a, that's a strange thrill as well, because by the time it gets on television, um, You've seen it so many times, you've, you've seen it shot, you, you were there right from the inception, you wrote the script, you went through rehearsals, you've seen it shot, then you've sat through the edit, and then you've sat through the sound dub, and then you've sat through previews, and so you've seen it so many times, it, it, it's, there, are, there are no surprises left in it. Um, but it's still a, a curious thing, when it goes, actually is transmitted, you get this strange kind of buzz that, you know, oh God, the rest of the world is watching it now. I kind of like this question anyway, and I do get asked it quite frequently. As long as I can remember, I always wanted to be a writer. Yeah. Well, when I gave up the idea of being Spider-Man, um, <laughs> which was quite early on, though I, I, have to, I have to confess, when I was a kid, I was about nine years old, I did sew myself a Spider-Man costume <laughs> with the intent of, of, of going out and fighting crime on the streets of Salford. Um, but it seemed like it was a bit cold and rainy, really. <laughs> like, mercifully, I gave up that idea. But I, I've always wanted to be a writer. And I remember going to uh, the careers officer at school. He wasn't really the careers officer, but one day a year, he was the careers officer. And uh, no disrespect to teachers, but teachers don't make the best career <laughs> advisors. And they've never really sort of yeah. been in the real world, most of them. Uh, but um, I said I wanted to be a writer, and he said, well, yeah, but what do you want to do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> Which discouraged me. And I, I, I actually toyed with the idea of leaving uh, school after uh, O-levels at the age of 16 to, um, to go into journalism, because that was the path then, but I was too scared uh, not to get the qualification to go on to A-levels. 
And it wasn't really until I'd left school and I was going to university and um, I had a sort of road to Damascus moment where um, I was going to see a movie and in those days they used to have uh, B movies on, on with the main feature and it was the B movie playing we got got in after the start and uh, I, I, it was Woody Allen's play Again Sam and I'd never seen Woody Allen before and I started laughing in the aisle on the way to my seat and I sort of didn't stop till the end. I can't remember what the main feature was now but um, I just remember thinking that's that's what I want to do. I want to do. I want to make people laugh like that. I want to kill people with laughter. That's my <laughs> that's my ambition. And Doug and I both decided to do it at university. We'd, we'd seen an article about a guy who sent a script off to ITV, and they said, "Yes, we'll we'll make it into a series." And we thought, "Oh, that's a good way of yeah, <laughs> doing it. That'll work for us. <laughs> that, that, that works for me." <laughs> so we concentrated on writing the script uh, instead of doing our, you know going to lectures and things, and, um, and uh, the script got rejected. We, we, we were baffled, we were really genuinely thought that they were going to send around a limo with lots of dancing girls and champagne in it with a big check, and uh, honestly, so naive. And, uh, and then, at, at that point, we got thrown out of university and we were kind of stuck with having to become <laughs> comedy writers, or our parents would, would consider us bums. So we said, no, it was a, gen it was a plan. That was the plan, we were going to become comedy writers, and so uh, this is probably true about any endeavour. You work really hard at it, and you kind of totally focus on it. We were insanely focused on learning how to write comedy. I used to, this is days before uh, VHS videos, um, I used to, we used to watch um, shows we liked, like Porridge particularly, and The Likely Lads, whatever happened to The Likely Lads, and uh, old... Um, Hancocks and things, and I would tape, put a, a, a cassette tape, sound tape, uh, near the speaker, and then I would transcribe what was on the tape onto a script just to see what the script looked like and try and analyse it backwards, and um, and gradually learn the techniques, learn how to do it, and got better, made our mistakes, and got better. Really, I get asked this a lot. Doug and I learn our craft from. Um, listening to people we liked a lot and respected. And fortunately, a lot of them happened to be American. And the Americans tended to talk a bit more than the Brits about um, comedy techniques and, and, and how they achieve things. And, and, and uh, so people like Woody Allen and Neil Simon uh, were very strong influences on us um, because they talked about writing comedy and uh, uh, um, and because, you know, they were aware that, that there are techniques that you can learn and get better. And uh, when we were, uh, we, we, we got um, picked up, if that's the right word, by the BBC Manchester. We sent in a script to, to BBC Radio, a comedy department, and uh, got referred up, because we were living up in Manchester, we got referred up to producers in Manchester who, um, uh, one in particular, Bob Oliver Rogers, uh, took us under his wing, and um, he was doing a project called The American Way of Laughs, which is a terrific radio series that they went to America and interviewed just about every living comic at the time, and some, you know, for some it was the last interview, and some greats like uh, Kaufman, and it was, um, and, and they, let us have access to the raw footage of, of all this. So there were hours and hours of, of our comedy heroes talking about comedy. And it was just a fantastic opportunity for us to learn uh, about it. Um, so it was, it was mainly Americans, although obviously um, when we were growing up, uh, we were also influenced by uh, Galton and Simpson, uh, who wrote Hancock and Steptoe and Son, and uh, uh, Porridge, uh, which was Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet, and, and what have happened to the likely lads, those are the kind of things we liked um, over here. And in fact, uh, when we first tried to sell uh, Red Dwarf, we were billing it as uh, Porridge in Space. <laughs> and the, uh, the arrangement of the bunks in, uh, in Red Dwarf is very much uh, right. designed on the, the porridge uh, set up in the cell. The classic scenario for a sitcom used to be, the, the definition used to be, it's a group of people who don't get on but are forced to stay together. Yeah. 
and they, for, for lots of classic sitcoms, that was true. In, in some cases, the device doesn't have to be that stunning. It can be a family. You're kind of forced to live with your family, so, uh, and yet you don't have to get on. Um, so in many ways, uh, Red Dwarf was kind of a, a very much along those classic lines. It was people who didn't get on, but were forced to be together because there's no one else in the universe. It, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of writ large, really. Um, I think that's less true now, though. There's, you know, a lot of American sitcoms, like Friends, for instance, um, and, and Seinfeld even, um, they're not, they don't follow that formula of being, of being forced together. I think Seinfeld is fantastic. And uh, I think that that's sort of changed now, but um, not to say there's not room for that. Uh, but... Uh, you know, Seinfeld's genius on a level that's, that's unexplored yet, isn't it? I don't it, think I've seen an explanation for why it's so good. <laughs> well, I've actually got the complete box set series of uh, uh, Seinfeld on DVD, and I never, ever listen to commentaries on DVD, but I do on the Seinfeld ones because I, I'm looking for that insight. Why is this so, you know, out there on its own, really? This is a kind of light relief question. I think people look on the school bases with a kind of rose-tinted uh, afterglow and think, oh God, well, you, you know, you didn't have to worry about any real problems, did you? You didn't have to worry about paying the rent or making ends meet or, you know, real, real big, keeping your job, dying. <laughs> um, but I think when you're a kid, you know, you've kids are a lot more intelligent and aware than most adults uh, give them credit for. I mean, I certainly was uh, a lot smarter than uh, people treat kids now. Um, you know, they know what's going on. And children's problems are very, very real and very large. And being bullied at school is, is much worse than being bullied as an adult. As an adult, you know, you can do something about it. You can move for a start. You can, you can change jobs. But when you're a kid, you have no influence on your own life. You've got no control. Um, and you're forced to, to do these things you hate, you've got no power. Um, I think that, that uh, they're probably the worst days of your life, really. I mean, that, that's not to say I had a particularly unpleasant school, uh, school experience. I, I did, went to a good school and I enjoyed it and I wasn't bullied. Uh, but the problems I had, you know, were very much underplayed by adults and... Uh, I think it's a mistake we make, and I certainly don't think they're the best days of my life. I actually still, to this day, have nightmares about school. And I, as I say, I didn't have a particularly uh, bad experience. I have nightmares about exams. Exams were such a horror. I, today, you know, I actually had one last night, an exam nightmare. I have this recurring exam nightmare where I, I, I have to do my French A-level and I know what I know now, yeah. which is basically how to <laughs> order orange juice badly. And of course, when I went to school, um, they actually were legally allowed to beat you with sticks and shoes. I mean, that, really, the, that was the, the punishment at my school was that you could be beaten with shoes. Because <laughs> that's, that's like the Middle East, doesn't it? I mean, it was only on your bottom, but it's still, you know, it's not nice, is it? And, you know, it only takes uh, one psycho in the school, who's a teacher who's got that power, to, to make everyone's life a misery. Um, so, no, not for me. I don't think they're the best days of your life. And I think it's very patronizing to, to, to say that in front of children. I would never say that in front yeah. of a child. Um, having said that, you know, enjoy your school day. <laughs> <laughs>